And uh, throughout this season of Lent, we have been uh, pursuing a series that we've called For the Joy Set Before Him. And this is actually taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, when there was someone writing to believers about Jesus. And this is what they said. Uh, They said, look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for who the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. I was talking to a friend of mine who attends church here a couple weeks ago when we introduced the series, and uh, this person said, you know, that verse reminds me, that verse proves to me that only God uh, could have inspired the scripture because no human would have said, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That is not a human way of thinking. That is a divine perspective on the cross, that for the joy set before Jesus, he would endure the cross despising its shame. I've thought a lot about this verse over the last few weeks as we have been following Jesus on his journey to the cross. And I've begun to realize as I think about this that what it meant to endure the cross was more than just the wood and the nails and the crown of thorns. It was also the people that Jesus encountered on his way to the cross. It, It was groups of people who despised him who were rejecting him. It was not just the the literal cross, but it was the figurative cross as Jesus made his way. All that he endured, the rejection, the betrayal, the denial. And, And as he's making his way to the cross, we see three specific groups of people. And if we're true to ourselves, we can all see ourselves in these groups at different times of our spiritual journey. There are Jesus' adversaries, enemies of Jesus, who have been seeking to find a way to arrest Jesus and silence him. We followed them pretty much throughout the entire Gospel of Luke, his adversaries. Does it seem like you can do anything or Jesus could have said anything to have appeased them or satisfied them? They were going to be opposed to Jesus no matter what, his adversaries. There's another group of people who aren't necessarily adversaries, but they're critics of Jesus. They are people who are critical of Jesus. They're maybe, they, maybe they aren't sure about what they think about Jesus, but they're certainly looking for evidence that he is either who he claimed to be or they're looking for evidence that he is a fraud. But these critics aren't necessarily out to get Jesus, but they are critical of the claims of Jesus. And then finally, we see another group. These are the beneficiaries of what Jesus was going to accomplish. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to look with me in Luke chapter 22 as we look at these three groups of people. And I want to challenge you today not to think about which group am I in? Because the very fact that you are at church this morning, my guess is most of you would say, well, I'm not his adversary. That's what we would say. I'm not Jesus' adversary. I am not somebody who is out to get Jesus. And there's probably very few of you who would say I am, I, that you are a critic of Jesus. M- very few of us would say I'm a critic of Jesus. Now, we would all, for the most part, say we are beneficiaries of what Jesus did for us on the cross. But here's what I want to challenge you to do today. I want, to put you, I want you to put yourself in each of these categories. I want you to think of a time in your life when you were Jesus' adversary, when you were opposed to the ways of God. I want you to think of yourself at a time where you were critical of the claims of Jesus. And then, of course, I I hope by the end we will all see that we're beneficiaries of Jesus. Let's look at these three groups. Luke chapter 22, we'll begin in verse 63 and we'll go into chapter 23. Let's look at the adversaries first. The adversaries. Now, these are defined by just a few people, a few groups of people. You see the chief priests, you see the scribes, you see the assembly of elders, you see all the religious leaders primarily as Jesus' adversaries. And this is what it says, Luke chapter 22, uh, beginning in verse 63. Now, the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. So it wasn't enough that they were beating him, they were also mocking him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy. Who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. When day came, the the assembly of elders of the people gathered together, both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council, and they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. Jesus said this because he had done both of those things repeatedly. He had told them many times who he was and they didn't believe them. 
And he had asked them questions, and they had still denied. So Jesus knew, based on experience, that they would not believe him no matter what he said. But then he goes on. From now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they all said, are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, you say that I am. Then they said, what further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his lips. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ a king. Now, this is ironic because if you were with us a few weeks ago, you know that the Pharisees, these adversaries of Jesus, tried to set Jesus up by asking him if it was all right to pay taxes to Caesar. And you remember they were, they were trying to trick him because they knew that if he said, yes, you should pay your taxes to Caesar, that he would be rejected by the Jewish people who thought that they were being unfairly taxed. But on the other hand, if Jesus said, no, don't pay taxes to Caesar, well, then they had him, they could go to Rome and accuse him of trying to, uh, trying to create an insurrection against the Roman government. So either way, they thought they had him. And Jesus' response was a classic response. He said, show me a coin. And they pulled out a coin. And he said, whose picture is on it? They said, Caesar. And so Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar and give to God what is God's created in the image of God. So Jesus in no way told them not to pay their taxes. But what are they saying as they take Jesus to Pilate? They're his adversaries. They're saying he forbid us to give tribute to Caesar. And more than that, he himself claims to be Christ, a king, meaning that he is claiming to be king when in fact Caesar is king. Now the irony here is rich because the Jewish nation had been trying to throw off the Roman government for years and years and years. They did not want Caesar to be their king. They wanted to reestablish the throne of King David. And here, a descendant of David was, who had come, God himself taken on flesh to come to be the king, and they were rejecting him, and they were accusing him of saying that he himself was claiming to be the king. They were, in essence, saying, we would rather have Caesar as our king than have Jesus as our king. Why? Because they were adversaries of Jesus. They weren't interested in Jesus. It didn't matter what he said. It didn't matter what he did. It didn't matter what he, what he was able to convince them of because they had determined in their own heart that they were going to reject Jesus. They were gonna reject him. They were gonna reject him not just as their king, but they were gonna reject him also as a prophet. Now, there are three attributes of Jesus that the Old Testament points us toward. Uh, prophet, priest, and king. You've got these three categories of people in the Old Testament that you see. Uh, a prophet is somebody who basically stands between God and man, takes the message from God, and delivers it to the people. A priest is also between God and man, but faces the other way. A priest is somebody who takes the offering of man and tries to take it to make atonement for the sins of man to God. So you've got prophets and priests in between. And then you also have kings. Kings are God's representatives of heavenly divine authority on earth. They're to be God's representatives in terms of caring for people, but also in terms of leading and guiding people. So these three attributes of Christ, prophet, priest, and king. Now they challenge Jesus, if, you, if we're following along through this passage, they challenge Jesus on two of these points. They challenged him on the point of being a prophet and being a king. Notice what they did at the beginning, and back in verse 63, 64, 65. When they were beating Jesus, they blindfolded him, and they said, prophesy and tell us who beat you if you can. In other words, they were rejecting Jesus as a prophet. And then you see when they take him before Pilate, they reject him as a king. This man claims to be the king, but we have no king but Caesar. But what you see is the irony between these two things is that they don't see that they are about to fill Jesus' ultimate role as a priest by accusing him against the Roman government, by asking Pilate to have him executed. They are ultimately fulfilling Jesus' role as a priest by sending him to the cross where he will become the sacrifice for the sins of all people. They are facilitating Jesus' greatest offering as the priest, the final priest, the ultimate priest. 
Because Jesus himself, unlike the other priests who would take an animal and sacrifice it, Jesus himself will become the sacrifice on the cross. The adversaries, by accusing Jesus, are fulfilling the very thing that Jesus came to do, to make a sacrifice. And here's what I know about me, and maybe this is true about you. Come on, there there have been times in my life where I have knowingly and intentionally gone against what I know God told me to do or not to do. Knowingly. And I had been God's adversary. I have been an enemy of God. And I would love to tell you that that was only true before I came to know Jesus. But the truth of the matter is, I find myself an adversary of God on a more regular basis than I care to even admit. Because there are small ways and there are big ways that I deny him as a prophet, the messenger from God, as I deny him as my king, the ruler of my life, and as I deny him, I am only, I am only further, further confirming my need for him to be my priest, to be my sacrifice. I've been an adversary of God. But there aren't just adversaries, there are also critics. Look at verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 3. Now, the adversaries we see here primarily are two, Pilate and Herod. We see these critics, I'm sorry, the, we see the critics of Jesus next. Primarily, Pilate and Herod. Look at uh, verse, uh, verse 3. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? So we pick up here with this uh, accusation that the adversaries made against Jesus. And Pilate picks up, he's a critic, and he, Jesus answered him, you have said so. That's the second time Jesus has responded to that question with you have said so, that they have proclaimed it themselves. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt with this man. But they were urgent, saying he stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee, even to this place. When Pilate heard this, he asked whether this man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at that time. It's a classic politician move, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. He, he, he lives in that area? I don't have to deal with this problem. I can shirk this off on somebody else. I can send him over to Herod. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. Notice Jesus is not answering Herod at all. But now he had answered the adversaries and he had answered Pilate, but he's not answering Herod. The chief pri- uh, so he questioned him at length, but he made no answer. The chief priests and the scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. So you still see the adversaries are still accusing Jesus over and over again. And Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. Then arraying him in splendid clothing, he sent him back to Pilate. And Herod and Pilate became friends with each other that day. For before this day, they had been at enmity with one another. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, and he said to them, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find uh, this man guilty of any of your charges that you brought against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. So you've got Jesus' adversaries. They're opposed to Jesus no matter what. But then you have these critics of Jesus. They are, they're, they're seeking answers. They're not necessarily determined that Jesus needs to die, but they are critical of Jesus. And you see two different types of critics when you look at this passage. You see an active critic or a seeking critic, and you see a passive critic. The active critic or the seeking critic is Pilate. That Pilate seems to genuinely want to know something about Jesus. He is curious. In fact, the Gospel of John gives us a little more insight into Pilate. Because in John chapter 19, Pilate asked Jesus this question. What is truth? What is truth? I mean, Pilate is truly seeking answers. And then John tells us that from that day forward, Pilate sought ways to release Jesus. Pilate is an honest critic. He genuinely wants to know. He's got questions about life, and he is asking Jesus these questions. We know from Matthew chapter 27 that Pilate's wife had a dream, and Pilate's wife came to, came to Pilate and said, no matter what you do, do not be involved with condemning this man to death. And Pilate famously washed his hands 
of Jesus' blood. Pilate is a seeking critic. He is an active critic. And what did Jesus do in response? Jesus engaged Pilate in a serious conversation that Pilate took seriously. They are having an in-depth conversation about what is truth, what does it mean to be a king, all of these things. But then you have another kind of critic that you see in Herod. You have a passive critic. And this is Herod. Look what he said in verse, Luke 23, verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad for he had long desired to see him because he had heard about him and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. Herod wanted a show. Herod wanted a show. He wanted to see some fireworks. He wanted to see somebody raised from the dead. He wanted to see a blind person get their sight back. He wanted to see some water turned into wine. He wanted a show. He had heard rumors of these things happening, but he had not seen them himself. So here he thinks, I have the opportunity, show me. And when Jesus did not respond, Herod made his own show. Look at verse 11. Herod and his soldiers treated him with contempt and mocked him. And this is what a passive critic does. And what is Jesus' response? Jesus doesn't even speak to him. He doesn't even answer his questions. Why? Because he knows, unlike Pilate, who is an honest critic, he is truly seeking answers. Unlike Pilate, Herod is a passive critic. He's not seeking any truth. He's not seeking any answers. All he wants is a show. And Jesus' response is silence. It reminds me of what Jesus told his disciples when he warned them, don't cast your pearls before swine. And here's what's true about me. I have been a critic of Jesus. Maybe you have too. I have been both an active and a passive critic of Jesus. I've been an active critic of Jesus when I've been truly seeking answers of things I don't understand. When I really, really have struggled in my heart to understand what is truth and what does it mean that Jesus is is king and what does it mean that he is lord i have struggled as an active critic of jesus and here's what you need to know today that's a good place to be especially if you're here today and you wouldn't even say that you're a believer in jesus you don't know what you believe i would encourage you be an active critic ask the difficult questions jesus didn't shy away from those questions in fact he engaged with Pilate and he sought to answer those questions but i've not only been an active critic of jesus I have also been a passive critic of Jesus. I've been a passive critic of Jesus when I have let my questions become excuses to do what I wanted to do anyway. When I have let the hard issues about faith and belief, when I've let those become boundaries in my life that have just given me an excuse to live in sin and to reject God. See, I've been a critic. I've been an active critic and I've been a passive critic of Jesus. But there's another group that I want us to look at, and that's the beneficiaries of Jesus. Look at verse 18 of Luke chapter 23. And we see the story of Barabbas, who is probably the most fortunate convict convict ever. The story of Barabbas. He He is the name of somebody who is probably better known than most convicted criminal, uh, any of any other convicted criminal in all of human history. Look what it says in verse 18. But they all cried together. Who? Who's crying together? The adversaries of Jesus. They all cried together, away with this man and release to us Barabbas, a man who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection started in the city and for murder. In other words, Barabbas was a bad guy. He had started a a true rebellion against Rome. Uh, uh, He had started this rebellion to try to reestablish the kingdom of Israel, to throw the Romans out. And in so doing, there had been people who had died. And because it uses the word murderer, it's probably not even just that they died as a, as a result of the insurrection, but, but maybe Barabbas had been a part of assassination or intentionally murdering people. But we know that he was a convicted insurrectionist and a murderer. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. Remember, he's an active critic. He wants Jesus to be set free. But they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And a third time he said to them, why, what evil has he done? I have found, him to, I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent, demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified. And their voices prevailed. 
So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder for whom they had asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. Here's what is true. Maybe you would struggle to say that you've ever been an adversary of God. Maybe you have a hard time seeing yourself as a critic of God, passive or active. But here's what is true. Every single one of us is Barabbas. Every single one of us was destined for our own cross. And because of what Jesus has done, every single one of us has been set free from the consequences of our sin. While the penalty of our sin was laid on Jesus. See, everyone can be a beneficiary. Even his, even his adversaries, even his critics. It wasn't just Barabbas who benefited from Jesus' crucifixion. I mean, obviously, he is, he is maybe the most obvious as we read through this passage of Luke chapter 23. Here, a convicted, condemned criminal waiting for his death, sitting on death row, waiting for his sentence to be carried out, and Jesus comes along, innocent, without sin, guilty of nothing, his adversaries are finally having their way. The critics cannot stand up to the pressure and Jesus is condemned to die and Barabbas, through no work of his own, through nothing good that he had done, is set free. This is our story. Every single one of us. As the religious leaders began to plot Jesus' arrest, Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, said something that was so prophetic. In John chapter 11, verse 50, Caiaphas said this, you do not realize that it is better that for you that one man should die for the people than that the whole nation perish. See, whether you're an adversary of Jesus, whether you're a critic of Jesus, we're all beneficiaries of Jesus. Jesus from the cross cried out to his father, forgive them, father, for they do not know what they are doing. The redemption of even Jesus' adversaries and critics was part of the joy that was set before Jesus. See, these adversaries, these critics, all of these people who stood between Jesus and the cross, who were actually trying to get Jesus on the cross, they were the joy that was set before Jesus. Barabbas was the joy that was set before Jesus. You are the joy that was set before Jesus. Even those who have been adversaries and critics of God are beneficiaries of his grace. When you were God's enemy, Christ died for you. For God demonstrated his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, while we were enemies of God, while we were adversaries, while we were critics, both active and passive, Jesus died for us, for the joy set before him. And here's the invitation that he extends to you and to me and to all the world as he stretches his arms wide on that cross. First thing we have to do is you have to admit that you've been God's adversary. You have been God's enemy. It wasn't just the chief priests. It wasn't just the scribes and the Pharisees. You have been God's enemy. Your sin sent Jesus to the cross. Admit that you've been God's enemy. But then, you have to critically evaluate the claims of Christ and choose to believe. Critically evaluate the claims of Jesus. And some of you who are here today, some of you who are listening online, some of you may find yourself in that position. If, you're, if you've listened this far to a sermon, my guess is that even if you don't believe in Jesus, you must still be an active critic or you wouldn't be listening. Critically evaluate the claims of Jesus and choose to believe what he's done for you. There's, there's no other world religion, there's no other faith, there's no other teaching that doesn't require you to do something for your own salvation. It is not about what you do for salvation, it is about what God has already done for you. Just like Barabbas, sitting in prison, sentenced to death, waiting to die, God has sent Jesus. Critically evaluate the claims of Jesus and choose to believe. And finally, accept the benefits 
of what he's done for you on the cross. Just receive it. Accept what Christ has done for you on the cross as he loved you even while you were an adversary, as he was patient with you even while you were a critic, and as he extends his mercy for those who will receive it for your eternal benefit.